All right, we're only we're only one past the hour, but I think we can probably get started. These meetings have been uh, taking the full time, so we'll get we'll we'll get going. Um, Audrey's myself, then we'll have the county go, and then any members from the ARP. Uh, anyone else, you can introduce yourself um, once we get going the interactive session uh, upon your first comment. So I'm Rose Newberry. I'm the project manager from Judec, the consultant team that'll be writing the ARP, and I'll hand it off to Jenna. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Jenna Kay. Um, it's nice to see some familiar names and faces in the group this morning. Um, uh, for those of you who I don't know, um, I work for Clark County. I'm a long range planner. Um, and one of the hats I wear is that I am staff support to the Clark County Commission on Aging. So on behalf of the Commission on Aging, welcome and thank you for joining today's session. And we'll talk a little bit more about what it is the commission is working on. Um, but we do have a commission member on the line. So Chuck, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Jenna. Um, yes, I'm Chuck Green. I'm with the Commission on Aging and uh, probably the, the proponent of the uh, getting the budget from the County Council to update the aging readiness plan. So I'm excited to have these focus groups and looking forward to what people have to say today. Awesome. And then yeah, everyone else, you can introduce yourself once we get to the interactive session. All right, next slide. So we're gonna start with some product background. Uh, this is an update. The original age readiness plan was approved in 2012 through a lot of hard work and public engagement. So we're really trying to continue in that spirit. The existing plan had five chapters, including living longer, healthier housing opportunities, which we'll talk about a lot today, transportation and mobility, supporting health and well-being and independence, and turning silver into gold, which is a lot about the important role of seniors in our community. The 2012 plan had 91 strategies. Um, and then every year, COA would have annual progress reports uh, that would track the plan, but also have new strategies and ideas. Next slide. We also wanted to talk about how the Adrenalis plan is implemented, since it's a bit of a, it's a, it's a big plan that um, touches a lot of implementers. So something it does is it highlights the best practice and recommendations for local jurisdictions, including the county. So we can see things um, like ordinances of how interests should be built, which we prioritize an ADA, and then individual jurisdictions, including the county, can adopt these best practices highlighted in the ARP. It also sets standards for community involvement and monitoring of the plan, so who we should talk to and, and how um, to make sure the plan is working as it needs to. And then most importantly, it connects planning, advocacy, and service providers in the county to do a holistic, um, uh, to holistically address aging in the county. So the example I like to use here, say you think of someone who needs to get to the doctor and that cannot drive, they need to get out of their house, um, which maybe needs a ramp. Um, they need to have a house, uh, ideally, and, and place, place to live. So there's a housing component. You need to get from the housing, maybe through a ramp. Uh, then they walk on city or county sidewalks to then get on a C-Tram bus. So you're dealing with four agencies, planning standards, uh, maybe retrofits. And so thinking about how all these things work together within service providers in the county uh, and the jurisdictions themselves, really connecting those dots. It's really important role of the plan. And then why update? It's been 10 years um, and some things that we need to address um, is natural and human caused hazards. So it'll be a, a new chapter uh, that focuses purely on um, hazard response. And we had a really good uh, focus group meeting a couple of days ago um, about that. We also need corporate, we learned from the pandemic. So adding, both public health emergencies, um, really talking about the emergency state of the pandemic and adding that in, but also service, the way that service is given in the county, thinking about meal delivery has also changed the role of COVID. So rolling all that in. And then some other key changes in the past 10 years, including things that have happened in housing, like the prohibition, proliferation of ADUs, um, new transportation options, um, changes in healthcare, um, both as a result of the ACA, but also service providers and the changes we've seen since COVID. Um, another important item we're thinking about is the, the, the baby boomers starting to retire, which both means a lot of people are retiring. We have just a big aging population, but also the diversity of who's retiring. Um, you know, we would basically have two generations in retirement age, um, both the boomers and, and their parents ostensibly. Um, and that's a range of needs and issues that we need to think about. It's not a monolith, it's, it's really diverse. Uh, and then lastly, to monitor the progress, to understand what's worked since 2012, 
maybe what needs to change directions and what's complete. Um, and so really is building on some of the successes there and making sure in the next 10 years, um, we're monitoring our progress and making sure we're meeting the needs um, of those we, we wish to serve. Next slide. And then the main purpose of today. Uh, so we're really trying to gain insights and problem definition and where to pitch the plan. So we won't have a housing unit today, but um, we're, we're happy to kind of broaden that out a little bit. Uh, a goal today is to brainstorm goals or end states. So where should the county be? What does success look like in housing? How do we know if we've done that right for the aging population? Understand how your work is already having a lot of success um, and to build on um, the programs and assets that exist. Uh, develop some new ideas as you go on the plan. And then also understand the hurdles in your work that maybe make that end state we talk about hard to achieve. All right, and next one. This is our last slide before we, we get to open it up. We wanted to talk about where we were in the process. So we're here at focus group meetings and we're still pretty early in the process, but we've already um, done some data gathering and document reviews. So reading a lot of what's existing uh, in the county. And we've also begun to talk to some stakeholders um, to understand how the 2010 plan was implemented. So we were talking to you today. We're holding five focus group meetings this week around all the focuses in the plan. Um, and then once we finish that, we're going to go back to our desks, really evaluate the 2012 plan and things we've heard during these focus groups, and to come up with some, some ideas about um, what the plan should look like. And then early in next year, we'll do working sessions. So we'll be calling on you again, but also the broader public um, to look at our work, to look at our strategies and our ideas, um, and to dig in, do some really deep dives to make sure that the plan is everything um, yourselves, the implementers, and the community needs. Uh, then after that, we'll have a draft plan, which will have a, a public review period, but thankfully a plan that hopefully everyone recognizes from the working sessions and these calls, uh, and then a final plan and adoption later in 2023. So yeah, so early in the meet, so early in the process, really trying to define the problems and hurdles and, and the why of this plan, what it should solve in the next 10 years. And then with that, I am going to share my screen and we'll open up um, the discussion. All right, can everyone see the Jamboard and not my calendar? Hopefully. Yes. That's right. Okay, yes. beautiful. I, I switched up my office today, so I'm still, still trying to figure out my audio and my, my screen. So I'm glad. So the first thing we're going to do is just really have a broad conversation. Some of you have been in past meetings, you know what this is like. We're really just talking about what would it mean to be successful? What is the end state? What is age friendly? Is it um, everyone having a home uh, that's ready to age in place and having, uh, like I know my home isn't, um, they have stairs um, to up and door home. So is it, or is it those things? Uh, really what, how would we know that our community is age friendly from a housing um, standpoint? And then I'll give you a little preview. Once we do that, we're gonna take these goals uh, and put them in this chart. And then we'll talk through solutions and hurdles um, to get back to those end states. But first, and what, we have some scribes to write down your ideas. I just wanna open it up. You can either type in the chat or unmute yourself. I just, how, do, what should this plan do? What does an age-friendly housing look like to you? What should our end state be? So <clears throat> this is Chuck. I, uh, my, my wife is a caregiver for, uh, a woman from church, and um, she is living in a VHA complex, uh, which is an apartment complex, but really needs in-home services. So I'd have to say availability, something that provides for in-home care or assisted living okay. in, 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 with housing. Sure, sure. In-home care. That's great. Anyone else? And again, you can type in the chat if you feel uncomfortable using the, the unmute Zoom feature. I think another way to look at this is what do you think is it's missing in Clark County? What should what should this plan be trying to do? What should we be trying to provide with this plan? Right, in the chat, I see maintenance and repair work, people who can't do it themselves, absolutely, or probably even afford it themselves. 
barrier free access? Affordability, rent control, yeah. Those are big topics right now. Uh, this is Benjamin with Kelsch. Um, I think one of the issues that often gets uh, kind of looked aside in the age in place discussion is our current suburban neighborhoods are very isolating to people of all ages. And so just making an age friendly community mean stay at home doesn't address the core issue of highly isolating neighborhoods that, um, you know, we know that isolation is bad for us as 15 cigarettes a day. There is tremendous connection to dementia. And so anything we can do to uh, to define an age-friendly community as one that makes it easy for an older person to be able to stay socially connected, that to me is really important. Yeah, social connection. And then also in the chat, I'm seeing access to transportation beyond medical appointments. I think in both those comments, are really hearing um, something about holistic communities um, and not just being able to be okay at home and be okay going to the doctor, but really having a rich, um, a rich life, a rich social life and otherwise. Yeah, yeah and I think- that, A part of uh -huh. that I think, hi, Aaron, um, involves multi-generational community. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That Irish cries will work on that. Totally agree. And then a perfect world, you know, breaking down silos and looking for opportunities to collaborate for us as professionals. I think that many times people are wondering, you know, where's the one stop shop for all my resources, whether it's the handyman, the person that can clean my gutters, maybe the financial planner, maybe the occupational therapist, mm -hmm. right? All those things don't sit in one place. And so the internet can feel overwhelming when it comes to solving problems. Mm -hmm. So looking at a conglomerate, conglomerate group of professionals that might be able to sort of attached to each other and offer a, a package of opportunity for solutions, elder care attorney, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I also find the internet daunting, so it can be really hard to put those pieces together. And this is a great start. Does anyone else have any other in states you think we should, what should Clark County look like in 2032 as far as um, housing and age readiness? All right, if you do have more ideas, you can pop them in the chat. Um, we can talk about them once we kind of dig through these, but I think this is um, gonna spur a really good conversation. And again, so um, you can see we have this example, um, a place for the age, currently age, and then we're gonna open up to talk about the solutions um, to this problem that maybe you think are just good ideas, you maybe you've seen other where, and then hurdles, what's stopping this from happening? Um, and then that will help us then back to our desk and start writing policies to make this happen. So we'll start with access to in-home services and care. Does anyone have any potential solutions to this problem um, or hurdles you've seen and why this isn't happening enough? So this is Chuck. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually uh, a member of the Rotary Club of Three Creeks and my uh, January program speaker is Taylor from Tiny Creek Assisted Living, which is a new VHA complex in Hazeldell. And so I would say uh, more of those, <laughs> more mm -hmm. affordable assisted living facilities. Got it, yeah. And of course the hurdle for that is getting to the more <laughs> in the funding. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Our scribes will put this down. Anyone else um, have any solutions or hurdles to additional in-home services and care? Hi, my name is Cheryl. I actually work for Vancouver Housing Authority. I'm a service coordinator in our 62 and over properties. And so I utilize um, D 
DSHS a lot to get my residents access to in-home care services, but I definitely would agree that we, we need more assisted living facilities that accept Medicaid. That's kind of a big hurdle when people need to transition to higher levels of care. Awesome, yeah, that's, that's really helpful. And then I saw Aaron put in the chat, build, uh, builder incentives for visible access home at the spec level, uh, jurisdiction permitting fee discounts. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I have a question for Cheryl. Um, is uh, the part you might have missed uh, before you came on was my wife is a caregiver for uh, a woman from church who lives at the, um, the VHA facility up in Battleground and has recently had a couple of um, emergency needs where somebody needed to call 911, but because it's a secured uh, FOB entrance, 911 couldn't get in um, unless somebody was in the room to let her, or had the FOB to let her in, or she pulled a, a kind of a emergency cord um, to notify the VHA, because there's no manager on site at night um, I don't know how it fits under this, but to me, if they're going to have in service, in home services, uh, being able to respond to 911 calls um, is one. But who would I talk to uh, at BHA to see how we can work around this? Yeah, so I will actually email my supervisor, Kit, and we just got a new service coordinator on site. I believe the property that you're talking about might be St. Helens. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, so um, that's that's a pretty easy fix, especially if the resident has like an emergency, like a personal alert device. Um, uh, no, we can no, she doesn't. But yeah, I, and yeah, Kit can email me. It's Kit Coran, right? Yeah. Yeah, and she was actually one of our um, guests during a fireside chat last year. But if I can get, if you can, um, maybe Jenna can get you my contact information or I can put it in the chat, but I'd, I'd love to um, have that dialogue and figure out what we can do. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I'll probably get you in contact with the property manager, Kim, because a lot of those fixes um, are pretty easy to get access and we can talk about it more too, so we're not taking up time, but they're definitely perfect for it. Appreciate it. Of course. And then uh, we'll put in the chat, uh, addressing the shortage of care providers, home care aides. Yes, and we've heard that a lot through um, other stakeholder groups. This, you know, it's it's beyond Clark County, right? That's happening everywhere, but um, certainly something we're, we're going to be addressing in this plan because um, it's, it's so prolific um, and a real kind of really scary problem. This is Benjamin with Kelsch. Yes, I think that's an essential one because we can do everything to make access to home services, but if there's no caregivers to provide that service, it's kind of useless. I think a solution that we could offer as a community would be um, some sort of consortium that allows all the care providers to be able to pay a fee per care partner that buys better benefits than any particular care provider can provide on their own because most of our in-home care services are very small, um, locally owned franchises, et cetera. And they just can't compete with Amazon. They can't compete with Microsoft. They can't compete with um, Taco Bell. Um, and so being able to offer something as a community that gives really good benefits to care partners could be huge in addressing that. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. And then Aaron uh, put in the chat, training more remodelers um, to do home modification and home assessments uh, for universal design and aging in place um, and laundry options. Uh, business coaching, training to grow, um, the business with the 50 plus marketplace and the boomer consumer, um, along with the adult child decision maker. Yeah, fantastic. Samantha put in the chat, solutions, increased awareness of community phone numbers for agencies that can help folks review options and resources for home care and other services. For example, the area on aging disability in South of Washington I would not solve the problem, but would be able to um, provide uh, the ability for those in need to review options. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Ads has been a you know, great partner. I think going to be a, a big part of this plan. I don't know for sure our local situation on this, but I was just talking with an OT who is advising a family 
on what to do as their um, home builder was building their home and they wanted to make sure they had the doors a certain um, uh, you know, certain width and the home builder simply said, that's not in our scope. We don't do that. So they had to build their brand new home and then they had to tear out their brand new door to put that, you know, to make sure it was wheelchair accessible. And it would be interesting to do a, at least a review of our current code to make sure that all home builders have to provide some core ADA type, um, uh, you know, uh, standards in, in homes um, versus having to retrofit after the fact. That's, yes. Yeah, that's exactly my personal mission. So I'm a licensed architect in Seattle. I grew up in Vancouver. My parents still live there off Fruit Valley. Um, and this is exactly what I'm going, going to do is go through this teaching of, but there's no such thing. So the residential home builder, you know, inherited a spreadsheet from dad in the 90s and don't mess with my bottom line the spreadsheet the back you know the bottom number is black not red so la 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 well then the market has to dictate what we need and people over 50 plus so the spec builder doesn't care about anybody over 40 they build first and second time homes and that's it and yet 95 percent of our housing stock is that Therefore, the need to educate the public, educate the builder, disrupt the remodeling industry and the home builder industry. Yeah, that's those are really helpful comments. And uh, even, even as a planner who knows a lot of building, uh, it's, it's surprising um, that that we're still we're still fighting that. And my my I live in a very old home that we learned yesterday just from moving some items. It's definitely not wheelchair accessible. We could we could move um things between rooms, but yeah, that's that's surprising. That's really helpful, and definitely something in the scope of the plan. Rosie you might want to look at our annual report of the commission about four or five years ago, where uh, in uh, aging in place and housing codes and development codes were developed were addressed, and some recommendations came out of the commission. Um, unfortunately, the policy side didn't carry forward with those, so um, it might be something to uh, research and have um, with the follow up from this focus group as far as what we can do in the update of the plan as to how to approach that. Yeah, that's awesome. And then uh, just around education before I move to the next item, uh, we are surveying every jurisdiction. Um, in the county for uh, their code to see um, where they've made those changes just for like, I mean, just for signs and their font sizes, uh, but also for the visibility standards. So we're, we're asking and trying to get a real pulse on uh, where those codes are right now um, and then building some models in. So this is very much in the scope of the plan and great to hear about. Um, if anyone has any ideas, you can always pop them in the chat, but I'm gonna scoot to our uh, next goal. Um, which is maintenance and repair work for people who can't do it themselves. So like we're talking about this, um, if you do live in an old house like me or a spec, you know, house or a spec builder didn't really care about literacy, how do we help people um, do the maintenance, the repair work, and then the retrofits? Um, I've been making a mental list in my head of every retrofit I would need in, in this home. Um, how do you get those done for people who can't do it themselves um, or maybe can't afford to? So this is Chuck. Uh, my Rotary had a um, hooked up with a group called Safe Homes for Seniors, which is a Meals on Wheels people, kind of a new um, group in, in that organization. And we did do at least one project um, a couple months ago uh, to dealing with the maintenance aspect. Um, unfortunately, this one was way over our heads and, and uh, it was like clearing blackberries and discovering cars that were buried under the blackberries. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is there is a group starting out who's who's trying to do that. It's, it's safe homes for seniors. Um, if we could find more of those organizations, so that was something to address this issue. Mm -hmm. Awesome. One of the hurdles therein, Chuck, is skilled labor in the construction force, right? And then everybody has a shortage of everything at the moment. Um, I know that our Home Builders Association in our county uh, preaches regularly, even at the school district level, that training that there's only a white collar future is ridiculous. And 
that your plumber probably costs as much as your doctor right now because there's so few plumbers, right? And so mm -hmm. the idea that you can't make a living without going to college, you know, a third of the workforce that learn the trades is, is about to retire. So it's going to get uglier. And so back at the grassroots level of who do you tell and why does it matter? I mean, anybody could make a killing starting a business as, you know, a senior maintenance person and advertising correctly. We just need people to know the trades. Yeah, and that's a good point because um, some of these needs for fix-it projects, uh, maintenance and repair work, it really needs skill and trade people to do it. Um, and it's it's a it's an insurance liability thing for one, but just, uh, just to be able to do the work correctly. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are really helpful comments and, and really good ideas. Any other comments on uh, maintenance and repair work? Awesome. I think that, that was that was fantastic. I, I'm already having uh, lots of lots of ideas for for the plan and reach out to this is great. Uh, barrier free access. Um, I don't know who, um, but this is a goal. Um, but if you want to expand, yeah, I was the one that put that in. My name is Aaron Marvin. I'm a, a custom builder remodeler here in Clark County, um, and we're just seeing that, you know, more and more if you like smart design with barrier free access gives people the ability to age in their home and no matter what may happen, um, you know, it's, it's just, a, it's a comfortable space. It's somewhere that allows people to, to flow through and, and stay in their home and age gracefully. Um, or even, you know, younger generations, if you have an accident or, or wind up in a wheelchair or something like that at some point, there's not a ton of modifications, remodeling that needs to have happen at that point. Um, we, we put a lot of focus into, into it, but we are, you know, we're a custom builder. And so everything is a one-off custom. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just, you know, spending more time educating people on the benefits of it, it will drive more of the, uh, the consumer request. Um, mm -hmm. and then would keep us from having to go through the whole mandate, mandating things into code and, and forcing the issue, um, which just adds additional costs that are unnecessary when it's consumer driven and and easier to do, it, it tends to be a, a less expensive add-on as well. Yeah, that's great. I totally agree with Aaron. The biggest challenge is psychology 101 and the power of denial. Um, and there, therein lies the real hurdle, uh, quite honestly, is that, you know, if I talk to my parents about it, now luckily they believe me because of what I do, but, you know, most people don't want to talk about aging. And so educating the public, you can go broke doing that. Um, Aaron's right, long-term, uh, I've been speaking on stage once a month for 13 years on this topic. Uh, and it's just starting. And quite honestly, I think it's coming out a little bit because of DEI and, you know, mm -hmm. post Floyd and all those and, and equitable and inclusive. Uh, has grown to not just mean race or gender or economic status, but also the disability community is coming aboard. In fact, Washington State, I'm working with two guys who just for the first time on the MLS for home searches, there's now an accessible button for homes. It's only in Washington state and they're working on taking that national Aaron's correct, but it's decades of effort. And okay. so yes, we need more people doing it. That's not the question. Right. And I think the narrative that we use is that nobody's ever complained about not having to step over or step into something, you know, so having no stairs at your front door is not something that people walk up to your house and go, Oh, no stairs. Right. It's, it's not something that anybody thinks is out of place or out of the norm. Um, and it's not something that's always even necessary at that time. But, um, you know, if you have a, a guest that can't access over stairs or, um, you know, I even use the example of like old dogs, right? People love their pets. And sometimes your dog gets to the point where it can't navigate stairs. Um, you know, even that becomes an entry level entry point um, for the con conversation of why accessibility and barrier-free access can really be beneficial. Um, 
So the other example I use is, is laundry baskets, right? Like if you can walk through a door without raking your knuckles on a, on the door jams of laundry baskets, right? Nobody's going to complain about that either. So um, there's a lot of simple things that you can have conversations that don't necessarily tie into um, the conversation of disability later on. Um, it's just a comfortable space to live in. Yeah, good design disappears, and it works just as well for a six-year-old as it does for an 86-year-old. That's what universal yeah. design means. Absolutely. Yeah, those are great comments. Yeah, my first apartment in Portland, you could tell it was a, I mean, I'm a planner, so I could tell, and it was just, Aaron, you're right, the not scraping your knuckles, it's those little things that, and I was also very pregnant, so it's lovely. <laughs> um, so I, I think that those are, those are great comments and something we can have to put in the plan. Rose, I wonder about a possible solution being some sort of property tax incentive for buy home uh, for families that build homes or buy homes that are accessible and barrier free. Yeah, yeah. So that's what was. I like it. Rose, you should make a note in here. House Bill seven six seven six. I spoke in Chicago with Louis Tenenbaum, who's the author of that House Bill. Uh, and it is trying to create a $30,000 tax advantage to come off of your uh, AGI gro uh, adjusted gross income if it is put into home modifications related to aging in place. Awesome. You said 7676? Six, six? Yep, you typed it correctly. Perfect. Well, that's all this price. Oh, we have people behind the scenes that are much better typing than I am. Fantastic. All right. Do you have anything else on this bear for access aging in place idea? All right. It's been wonderful. Aging in place is just something I've, I've been a nerd about since college, so this is really fun. All right. Uh, next, affordability and rent controls, which um, obviously is, I think, a, a huge issue now. Interest rates and inflation. Um, anyone want to talk about the solutions um, of really cost of living, rent control, affordability? You know, I, I don't know if the the issue of rent control is is uh, actually been hotly discussed in Washington State, um, and I don't know, Erin, um, if you all up in Seattle, I think King County might have or Seattle might have had some discussions about that in recent past especially with the, the COVID um, issues. But I know that affordability, uh, I believe there was a change in state law a few years ago as far as the um, notice to raise rents and notice to, um, I guess, vacate uh, or evict uh, or change to expand that notice, um, at least in terms of letting the tenant know that they were they had a certain number of days to move. But yeah. we've, had, we've had issues down here in Clark County where um, a company comes in, invests in an apartment complex, then decides that they need to um, upgrade or, or actually in some cases they need to fix problems before the facility gets condemned, but the, the tenants can't find anywhere to go. And uh, there's... Um, couple of instances in uh, Hazeldale area and one in along Fourth Plain in Vancouver where that those were issues and the uh, County Community Services and the Council for the Homeless had to step in and uh, I think they were able to get most people relocated within a, a week or two but it was it was tough. Yeah I know as a landlord um, for our single family homes that we, yes the timeline to make people aware of rent changes or anything like that went from 20 days to 60. Um, it's definitely a lot harder to be a landlord. Now the flip side of that is it's killing the mom and pop because there's too much law and too much government. And so we're like, oh, never mind, I'm out, right? That's, that's the backfire of it. Uh, I do know that people are on waiting lists sometimes for two years 
that need housing. And that's everything from, you know, VA or veterans that have come home to the, the general population. So, I mean, we're seeing in Seattle what you're seeing in Portland and yeah, it got worse through through COVID, so. Perhaps it would be worth exploring, this is Benjamin, uh, per, exploring the ways that different municipalities have incentivized collaborative ownership um, instead of just kind of uh, big corporations being able to come in and, and build huge rental tracks and, and buy up lots of homes, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, co collaborative um, ownership being preferred and being treated differently. So for instance, if someone's building maybe an apartment complex of sorts, that's, um, you know, that the, the tenants have a voice, that the tenants have power and they're, they're actually able to make votes, et cetera, and buy shares um, and their rents go towards shares in that, in that, in, you know, uh, of that um, particular building, you know, things that are more collaborative, um, cooperatives, et cetera, might be a helpful way to move, uh, incentivize those types of organizational structures. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Alternative voting structures, collaboratives. Yeah, probably learn from Jeplin Cage's behavior. Oh yeah, we'll put in the chat. Um, dealing with uh, travel, Airbnb, uh, the BB issue, um, and presented housing. Yes, I, th I, I, I think that um, renting your home for temp for temporary spaces is certainly um, a it, especially thinking about the Northwest and like um, you know maybe based on apartments or things like that. And there's definitely a hit on the, the rental space. So yes, I think that B and Bs are uh, cer Rose, certainly a hurdle. Uh, Rose, the city of Vancouver started tackling that issue because it's relatively unregulated, um, and so they started the process last year with with a survey of um, operators. So you might want to contact. And maybe Jenny, you can come up with the contact at the uh, city of Vancouver. Uh, I don't recall who it was um, in their either the housing or planning group, but um, that is something they have started investigating. I don't know if they how far they've gotten. Yeah, uh, there's some good examples out of um, the cities that are further along on this and that are more vacation destinations. There's some some good examples, although uh, the Airbnb really tends to fight jurisdictions that try to do this, and it can be. And our lights, it's definitely, it's a, it's a sticky one. I think All the right. downside, and, Rose, I think uh -huh. the downside of, let's say, rent controls and limiting Airbnbs is that a lot of times there's a lot of capital that is available to help us remodel our housing stock and make it more age friendly. So to me, I think it's more important to incentivize people who are flipping Airbnbs to do like barrier free flips, right? Or instead of doing rent controls, you're incentivizing um, landowners to remodel so that it's more age friendly. Because uh, if you just put the limits on, you end up just driving that capital into other directions rather than updating all of our housing stock to be age friendly. I think the, the core solution is really about tailoring uh, all this capital that goes into renovating spaces so that it becomes barrier free, it becomes universally designed. I think to me, that's the most, that's the biggest area we can have impact. Yeah, I th those are great comments. And just thinking about it, especially, I'll use the basement example again. If you live in a, a classic Northwest home, renting out your basement, if you're older and you don't need your full space anymore, maybe you will fund the remodel of the upstairs or, or allow you to stay in your home because that's actually helping you get income um, on your asset. So. I think it's been in your comments are, are spot on um, that it needs to be nuanced with the end goal of people staying in their homes um, in a way that is accessible to them. All 
right? Anything else on affordability or we can talk about social connection. Oh, and then we'll put in the chat, how many servers are seniors wanting to rent out a room to another senior? Yeah, I've also seen um, housemate services for um, uh, age diversity. So for younger folks that uh, can't afford um, some of the newer apartments in our area, um, discounted rent for them to help out with errands and chores. Hey, Jenna, um, might wanna put them in contact with Mark Majora's group, uh, was it Faith Partners for Housing? That, that's something that they're trying to do. Yes, we can do that. Awesome. Great. All right. We'll move on to social connection. Uh, and I think the other thing I, I heard when we were talking about this was the idea of not just the home being um, having access to barriers, but the neighborhood being um, really age friendly, disability friendly. So things we heard, sorry, Ben, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think our building codes are a big part of the problem because incentivizing, you know, apartment complexes and single family homes versus um, kind of a more um, communal kind of settings where you can have smaller homes, smaller, even tiny homes with um, beautiful landscaping and common common houses or common rooms. You know, it's just uh, some of our friends, my friends and I have been looking into doing that and just the the barriers to figure out how we would get something like that through the codes is so hard. Like we have like 10 families that want to buy, you know, 10 acres and be able to put small homes and be able to have a kind of communal big kitchen and a communal library, et cetera. You know, things that would make socialization possible is really being able to develop our neighborhood so they're, they're not just these large tracts of single family homes but that the homes um, open up to common spaces and common buildings and are not so large that you have to because you can't afford to live in a place that has a 3,000 square foot home as well as all these great common spaces it's just not affordable for most people but if you could have smaller homes um, and larger common spaces uh, with great walkable environments you know incentivizing that in our codes um, and it, I think it would be really helpful. Yeah, those are, that's, those are great comments. I read a great article once about um, how to zone and build a community to make friends. There's a lot of standards um, mm -hmm. and design to, to make it more sociable. Yeah, does anyone else have any uh, opportunities for social connection they wanna talk about? So this is Chuck. I know that the um, county and its cities are going to be starting uh, comp plan updates. Uh, I think the public process starts toward the end of next year and then things will be going on in earnest in 2024 and 25. So it would be nice to have what type of retrofit zoning, I'm, I'm not sure how you would call it, but um, those type of zoning changes that could allow for uh, putting in uh, a public place or a plaza or or something like City Ridgefield, for example, um, they do require for each new subdivision that it be a they set aside 25% um, for open space. And what city's getting from these new subdivisions are a lot of public parks being built kind of in the middle of the new subdivision. So it's it's it is an opportunity to bring the community together, um, but I think it's the it's the infill, the retrofit aspect um, does need some uh, look when it, we get into the comp plan updates. Yeah, absolutely. I'm seeing some great resources going to the chat, so we'll be taking those and, and looking into them um, as we start uh, writing out the plan. And yeah, I think Chuck, your, your point is well heard that the comp plan update and just code in general, there's a lot of opportunity there. 
I will put in the chat public purchase of development lots uh, as public spaces, um, hard to balance the need for housing community spaces. Yeah. I think if you can build close to like parks and schools, you also facilitate an opportunity for volunteering uh, with the younger generation and creating those intergenerational activities. Um, a lot of um, older adults don't drive or aren't able to drive. And so if they have walkable sidewalks um, and a shorter commute to walk to a school or a dog park, um, just being able to get outside and out and about Absolutely. Yeah, the, the challenge with this is our county's buildable lands model um, is kind of forced development into high density, you know, almost high rise. I think the last edition of it was like 18 units per acre or something like that. And that is um, multiple um, stories of housing, um, which has driven the competitive cost of, of overall developable land so high that uh, that's what's kind of driven the new housing market and why why these kind of communities are just not being built. That's really helpful. The 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 the, the billable lands is causing that issue. All right, anything else on opportunities for social connection? I just think that we have kind of, you know, you have two choices, right? In, in areas that don't get to build creatively, you have to invest in transportation, right? But areas that you can build creatively, you don't have to make that same investment in transportation because the community gets built in to the space. I mean, on two acres, we at Kelsch Communities over at University Village across from Washington State University, you know, we're all of our 280 elders are going to have incredible socialization. They're going to have classes. They're going to be at WSU taking classes. They're going to be at Clark College taking classes. They're at Clark College on our site taking classes. They're not going to need to drive anywhere. They're going to have so many socialization learning opportunities. But when you don't build that way, then you have to rely on a really solid transportation program. I think we kind of forget that cost too, right? Um, I'm at a conference and someone was talking about, we take that all for granted about how expensive that all is. And if you build it in, it won't cost that much. I think we also need to look at, uh, I know the terms micro mobility, but <clears throat> the electronic assist uh, vehicles like tricycles that are out there now, um, they're great to have, but they really, uh, the seniors won't feel safe trying to ride those in a bike lane mm -hmm. um, and try to ride it on a sidewalk. You've got curb ramps that are not built to ADA standards. Um, so that's one. The other is um, I know Ridgefield has um, this and some a couple of other small cities are looking at it, golf cart zones, where they allow the use of golf carts on uh, 20 to 25 mile an hour uh, central city streets um, to get around um, and, and have allowed that. Um, but it, it's limited where you can do that and it's limited where you can go with those. I would also say that if there's anything that our county can do to shape future commercial space so that it is intentionally designed to be very walkable, very accessible, and um, incorporates communal spaces. Um, that can be a great solution because a lot of older folks find it, you know, okay, I'm going to go to the store. I can get out to the store. Well, instead of parking in like a Safeway parking lot, trying to get over to Safeway, go in, get out, get home, and oh, that's all I can do. Imagine some of these more modern um, commercial spaces where there's cafes and there's lots of walkable areas and there's fountains and it's, it's like a protected area from cars and there's all kinds of community spaces. There's a library nearby, there's a bookstore, there's a little park. If we were able to shape future commercial development to no longer be strip malls, but to be more of that modern communal kind of commercial space, I think that would help so many older folks who can at least take 
a dial a ride, so to speak, to one of those spaces to go shopping. While they're there, they're able to also socialize and meet friends at the same time. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. All right, we have about 10 minutes left, so we'll get on to the, the next one. It's been fantastic conversation how we're really filling up our boards. Um, access to transportation beyond medical appointments. I think this, you know, I don't know what you just said about um, uh, uh, commercial spaces, I think also can be something we said about um, at least, out, you know, not hospitals maybe, but other medical services. You know, if things are close together and we, someone will pay for the, the service to get to, to medical appointments, maybe there's, there's opportunities for things being co-located. So that's a great start. So you don't have any other, anything else about access to transportation beyond medical appointments? So I know we had a good discussion on this with the transportation focus group. We had Sean Donahue from CTRAN, who's the CEO of CTRAN. Um, and we talked about the current, which is kind of that on-demand um, infill, well, uh, transit system, but it's not a fixed route. It's in areas where they don't have the fixed route service, but it's still within CTRAN service areas. Um, so I'd like, personally, I'd like to see expansion of that. Awesome. Uh, and starting seniors, no, it's just about uh, go, go grandparent. Also about the current, yeah. There's a lot of great things that I've been hearing about in these meetings that I just think you should all know about um, a lot of the options we have. I think there's real value in incentivizing the use of some of these more personal innovative options versus investing lots of money in infrastructure that is not very person-centered. So for instance, a lot of transportation options require calling way ahead in advance, calling, waiting in line, waiting for your opportunity to be dropped off where some of these other services Mm, you know, you call and you have a ride in 10 minutes. And so figuring, could we take some of the funding that we use for these huge infrastructure projects and just make it a little bit cheaper to use some of these other person-centered services? Yeah. Yeah. Anything else for the access transportation at Beyond, Beyond Medicine? We have about five minutes left and we'll, we'll take, um, oh, and then um, we'll open the chat. We advocate the state, um, who advocate the feds to increase Medicaid and um, uh, trans transportation options to include social interaction. So that acknowledgement, that um, interaction, isolation, those are all connected to health and our well being. And I think we, we've talked about this a little bit, we've touched on it in other um, items. But a multi generational community, we talked about the, the co housing and things like that. But are there, is there anything else we want to talk about in our last few minutes together um, about how to make a multi generational community? Well, I do know that the one upside of affordability of housing is that we're seeing a lot more house sharing. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, the term North Nash, uh, naturally occurring retirement community, as you see in Finney Ridge in Seattle, um, you're seeing people living together that are of different generations. Um, unfortunately, I think it's being forced at the moment versus being, <laughs> you know, recommended or praised for social skills and interaction of all generations. But um, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, it's a very, very big picture vision that doesn't necessarily happen between how you build an assisted living that pencils and how you build a, a plot of single family that pencils. Yeah. And that's a bit of a trap that a, a new service that enables multi-generational and uh, comp apartment complexes. 
Yeah, what they do is they um, partner with existing apartment complexes and they take offline maybe five units, 10 units. Mm -hmm. And then they provide extra services that a senior might need in that apartment complex. Um, everything from meals, to transportation, to healthcare services, et cetera, and make it possible for them to live in an intergenerational community and not have to maybe go to a assisted living. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely just recognizing um, that there's a, a range in needs um, that, you know, skilled nursing is much different than, than maybe just needing some transportation or some meal help. So yeah, I think it's fantastic. And we, we also talked a lot about how universal design is not just age-friendly, right? There's a lot of these principles um, that, that can make everyone happy. And thought it's wheelchairs, it's it's strollers, it's knee scooters, it's it's very broad and made that education. Well, we have three minutes left, so I'll let uh, Jennifer from the county pipe in too. But I also want to echo um, how grateful uh, we are for you spending an hour with us today, having these great conversations. Um, you can expect to hear from me again right after the Thanksgiving holiday. We'll be posting these videos up on the Clark County website. And we'll have an opportunity for those um, who maybe attended and want to say more, or those who couldn't attend to participate in a similar experience um, to list these kind of the problem solutions that we should be looking at during um, our policy development over the holidays. And then um, we may reach out just one on one, but there are a lot of great ideas here today that we really want to dig into. So you might see those uh, calls or emails from my team. And then certainly again in the new year, you'll all be invited to and please spread the word about our workshops as we up into the broader public um, and really doing a deep dive, making sure that our policies and recommendations um, are sitting the needs and people kind of road test them and figure out, like Ben was saying with the Airbnbs, um, where we, um, how can we customize these to really meet those end goals? So there'll be a lot more opportunities. This plan needs to be collaborative because how many implementers it has, you'll be hearing um, a lot from us. And then Jenna, is anything you want to say in the last couple of minutes before we wrap up? I just want to thank you all for taking the time today to um, share your thoughts with us. Um, this is going to be really helpful for this plan update for the Commission on Aging. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. We'll close out. But yeah, in my email, I, I'm going to invite you. So please reach out in the interim. Um, my number's on there too, if you have anything else you want to share. All right. Thank you all.